Let me voice my appreciation again for all of those who are uh, helping with the Awana program. We appreciate your hard work, and of course, uh, appreciate you for bringing your kids to the Awana program. Pray, of course, as we minister to kids of all ages. Uh, I'm, I was thrilled when uh, Lexi came forward for baptism uh, this past week, and of course, uh, she had been visiting with uh, Brother Jimmy Brock, the director of our Association of Baptist Students. It's pretty obvious that he's, he's leading them in the ways of the Lord and in the truth of the Lord. And it's obvious uh, that these students are fond of uh, Brother Jimmy and Lana and that she has asked him to do the baptism today, and I'm thrilled. I'm also thrilled, of course, to report that he's been on uh, for about a year. Last year was your first year. You had about 15 kids coming, and I think you've quadrupled that this year. I mean, I think we have it about 60 kids or more, and maybe even be more, but the, the picture I saw at the first of the year was just fabulous. Some of y'all are here. I see college students all over the building. I'm glad that you came. I'm glad Brother Jimmy is here. I never want to pass up an opportunity to have somebody in the building that I hadn't heard preach in a while. I always say, well, you're it, so I tagged him. So he's coming to preach for us this morning, then we'll have a baptismal service to follow in a little bit. Would you come, Brother Jimmy? All right, good morning. So good to be with you this morning. Uh, for those of you who don't know who I am or have not met yet, uh, my name is Jimmy Brock, my wife, Lana, and we even have some students here from the ABS in support, mostly of Lexi and not me, but uh, that's okay. Uh, do you guys want to come and give a testi no? testimony? Oh, I didn't think so. All right. If you have a Bible, I'd like to invite you to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, uh, we are experiencing a lot of blessing at the ABS, and uh, to be honest, we wouldn't be able to do what we do without churches like you, and so we appreciate you, we appreciate your help and your support always. Um, we have grown every semester um, that I've been director, and that is not in any way bragging on myself, because apart from the Lord, we can do nothing. And we acknowledge that God is, uh, his hand is in it. And I'm telling you, last year, me and Lana, our focus was on relationship. It wasn't on evangelism. It wasn't on growth. It wasn't on marketing campaigns or getting to the campus. It was simply, let's build relationships with the students who are already here and establish ourselves as leaders and of, of the organization so that we can move forward. And in every semester, we have grown, and, and we're thankful for that, but we realize that it is the Lord who grows the church, and so, uh, and grows our ministry, of course. Uh, what I want to talk about today is why college ministry is important, why youth ministry is important, why church is important, and in Acts chapter 2, we see a church that experienced growth overnight. The apostle Peter preaches the day of Pentecost, try saying that five times fast, but he preaches the day of Pentecost and 3,000 people are saved. The question then is, well, what do you do with 3,000 new believers? And we're going to find that out today in the scripture. But before I get started, why is church important? Why is a biblical community important? Why is it important for you to be a part of this community? A guy by the name of Robert Putman wrote a book called Bowling Alone, and in the book, he says this, in American culture, the greatest epidemic that we are facing today is not disease, but loneliness. And of course, he wrote this book before the COVID-19 pandemic, and what he was talking about is, and, and just even in the title of his book, there are more people today that are going to restaurants alone going to movies alone, and even going out bowling alone. There are more people today living in isolation than ever before, disconnected from community, disconnected from friendship, disconnected with, from fellowship. And you don't have to read very far into the Bible to know that in the creation of, count of, of Genesis, that, that God creates all of these things and they are good, right? He creates this, they're good, good, good. And then he gets to man. And he says, it is actually very good. But then there's one thing that God notices that is not good. He says, it is not good that man should be alone. 
And so we should not be surprised that as more people live in isolation, disconnected from community and disconnected from church, that we see, uh, we see depression rising, we see loneliness and isolation rise. I mean, we see, we see suicide rates going up because they're disconnected from something that God said, it is good for you to have companionship and friendship and community. And that's one of the reasons why the church exists. And it's one of the reasons why I think our college ministry at the ABS is so important. As I studied into this generation, when I was, I was youth minister for 10 years, I studied into this generation, Generation Z, and what I found is they're actually less social than the previous generations before. I'll give you an example. When I turned 16 years old, as a matter of fact, on my 16th birthday, I went and got my driver's license, right? on my 16th birthday because I couldn't wait to have a little bit of independence and go and hang out with my friends, go pick them up. We'd go ride around town. We'd go hang out. Well, this generation, Generation Z, is actually waiting a little bit longer to get their driver's license. Some of you parents know what I'm talking about because they don't feel like they have to have their license in order to connect with their friends. They feel like they're already connected all the time through apps like Snapchat or Instagram or Facebook. They probably don't have Facebook, but, but you get what I'm saying. They feel already connected. They have texting and, 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 and FaceTime and video games they play online. They feel like they're already connected with their friends all the time and feel like they don't even have to be face-to-face to connect with them. But the byproduct of that and what's really happened is they feel more connected than ever but in reality, they're less connected socially and less connected to a community than ever before. That's why the church is important. That's why it's so important for what you're doing today, meeting together. That's why our ministry is important, because it's bringing the believers together and saying it is not good that you live life alone. And for the Christian, it is not good that you do Christianity alone. You need each other. We all need each other. So what I want to do is I want to read uh, out of Acts chapter 2. What is this, what do 3,000 new believers, what do they do? Well, we see this in Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 42. I'm sorry, I'll start in verse 41. So those who accepted his message were baptized, and in that day about 3,000 people were added to them. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and signs were being performed through the apostles. Now all the believers were together and held all things in common. They sold their possessions and property and distributed the proceeds to all as any had need. Every day they devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple and broke bread from house to house. They ate their food with joyful and sincere hearts, praising God, and enjoying the favor of all the people. Every day, the Lord added to their number those that were being saved. The question I want to ask you this morning is, do you believe that this describes the church today? More importantly, maybe you need to ask, does this describe our church, Brister Baptist Church? Does this describe your, perhaps your Sunday school class or your small group that you're a part of? Because here's the thing, as the As depression and loneliness and suicide rates go up, so does a need for an authentic biblical community for people. People need community. They don't need to live in isolation. But as our churches, in our communities, are we providing that for people? So here's what I think. I think in the text it says they devoted themselves to several things, which every biblical community should. But what I think is that we don't have an attendance problem in our nation and in our churches. We have a devotion problem in our churches today. It says that the church devoted themselves, and that word devotion means a continuous, self-conscious decision or commitment. But our culture really has discipled us into not liking to devote or commit to anything. I mean, I want you to think about the commercials that you see on TV. You probably see commercials that say, you know, no long-term contracts. You don't have to commit to this program or to this thing, right? 
uh, you can cancel any time, and for us, that sounds great. Think about relationships. There are more people that live together before marriage than ever before, or in, in, or in non-exclusive relationships. That means that I can date you, but I can also date other people as well as I date you, right? Divorce rates are still at an all-time high, right? Uh, what about people's attention? When you have a conversation with somebody, when's the last time you were able to, to commit to even the conversation without the other person reaching for their phone or being distracted in some way? In a lot of ways, we are not committed or devoted to very much of anything in our lives, and we're, our attention is constantly um, divided between a lot of things in our life. But this says, the text says that the church, the believers, devoted themselves to four things. And so the first part of the sermon, I'm going to break down the four, what the, what the early Christians, what the early um, believers devoted themselves to. And then we'll look at what was the result of their devotion. So here's the early church's devotion. In verse 42, it says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. So the first thing we see here is the apostles' teaching. If you're taking notes, you can write that down. The early church's devotion, the first thing is this, the apostles' teaching, and that would be God's word, okay? Why would you say God's word? Because what the apostles were teaching was the Old Testament. That's what they had at the time. And so understand this, the New Testament at this time is still being written, okay? Still being written. They didn't have the New Testament yet, but they had the Old Testament, and they would have been teaching how Jesus fulfilled the Old Testament as the promised Messiah, right? He is the, he is the promised Christ, the promised Messiah of the Old, and they're teaching and how he fulfilled that Old Testament promise. But they would have also been teaching what Jesus had taught them. We know the Great Commission. Jesus tells his disciples, go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Jesus told his disciples, go and teach others what I have taught you for these past several years that I've been with you. So we know that the apostles would have te taught the Old Testament and how Jesus fulfilled it, but also Jesus is teaching to them. Um, and so we can, we can go ahead and say that they were devoted to God's word. What I also think that they were teaching was not just information, but also application. Because we don't see a church that, is, that comes and consumes and, and just sits and soaks. We see a church that is active in the community and is actually living their faith out. And for the believer in here, your job is not to come and just consume, but to but to we, we take in the word because now it's our turn to go take the word to other people. And so we see a church in action. So they were devoted first and foremost to God's word. The second thing it said they devoted themselves to was the fellowship. And Baptists love the word fellowship, right? Like we have fellowship all the time, right? That means we get to have pulled pork or whatever you guys eat, all you Arkansas fans. I'm not going to tell you my team right now. But they devoted themselves to fellowship. And now let me just say this. This is not talking about a potluck dinner. This is not talking about an ice cream social. The word that they use here for fellowship is the word koinonia in Greek because the, the Bible was first written in Greek in the New Testament and uh, Hebrew in the Old Testament. The word here is koinonia. It is a common bond that leads to a common purpose. A common bond that is the gospel that binds us together. In other words, I don't have to uh, be a member of your church to come and worship with you and be a part of the family. We are bonded together by the gospel of Christ that we are all adopted into the family of God. And we can worship together and have unity together and we can be a family together. This common bond led them to a common purpose that was they, they received the gospel and were saved, and now their purpose was to take the Great Commission, the gospel, to the nations, to other people. In other words, the gospel came to you because it was headed to somebody else. The gospel is always on the move, and God always wants you to be on mission for him. This common bond that leads to a common purpose, that is the fellowship that they had. 
this word also describes a relationship between us and God. It is this restorative, like at one point in your life, you were enemies of God, separated from his presence because of your sin. Isaiah 64 says that, that you are separated from, your sin separates you from God. And because of that, you were once enemies of God. But because of the gospel, because of Jesus, who took your place on the cross, you can now be brought back into a right, restored relationship with him. And that's what this word fellowship is. We're back into fellowship with God. And because your vertical relationship between you and God is restored, now now he has called you to love the others around you, even your enemy, even people that hate you, even people that you cannot you just cannot stand or they cannot stand you um, because of your relationship with God, this koinonia fellowship you have. Now he's put you on mission to help restore relationships around you. So that's the second thing they devoted themselves to. The third is this, they broke bread together. Now we can talk about the potluck because it actually means that they broke bread together and they ate together. But this really has a dual meaning. This, there's two possibilities here that they devoted themselves to, and I believe they devoted themselves to both. The first thing is communion. They would take communion together. They would take the, um, they would take the bread, and they would remember the body of Christ that was broken for us, and then they would take the wine, and they would drink, and they would remember the blood that was spilled out for us. They would remember the gospel, so they would commit themselves to communion, but also to breaking bread together. The word companion in Latin literally means someone that I share a meal with, right? When you share a meal with someone, you are saying you are welcome to my table. We are on the same team. We are family. We are friends. We are companions. We are co-workers and co-laborers in Christ. And that's what we want the church to be. You share a meal together because you're saying we're on the same team. We're a part of the same family. We've all been adopted into the family of God. Breaking bread also is closely related to the idea of hospitality. And I know that a lot of you do not struggle with that, but I wonder if you see your hospitality as an on-ramp to the gospel. When you invite someone to your table or into your house or out to a meal, I wonder if you're taking advantage of using that hospitality to leverage your life for the gospel of Christ and to share your faith with someone. And so our hospitality, our breaking bread with other people always leads us to a mission that is to share the gospel and the good news of Jesus with others. And the fourth thing they they devoted themselves to is to prayer. Now, for us, um, sometimes we reduce prayer to what I say, uh, what I call transitional prayer. It's like uh, we get so used to these prayers that we, we use them in, in places to transition our day or our services where, well, we have to pray to start the service. We have to pray before this part of it or we pray before our meal and it kind of transitions us from this point to this point. But for the early church, it wasn't transitional prayer, it was dependent prayer. The early church understand uh, was a heavily persecuted church. In other words, they would wake up, and because of their belief, they knew that they could lose their life that day. I wonder if you would pray differently if you knew that you could lose your life for what you believe. And that's where I believe the churches in America today need to turn back to, is not transitional prayer, not these prayers that, oh, I've, I've just said the same words every single time I pray. I don't know if, if you struggle with that, but I know I do. I say the same words when I go to prayer every single time. But these, I'm telling you, these early church saints are praying dependently on God to get them through the day. And a lot of them didn't know where their next meal was going to come from. A lot of them didn't know if, if they were going to be persecuted or the church was going to be burned down. They didn't know what was going to happen. And you don't have to read too far into church history to understand that the early church was very heavily persecuted. And in this early church, they saw prayer as essential. And as you, as a believer, I wonder if you see prayer as essential in your life. It is your connection between you and God. Are you dependent on God for your every need? Not your wants, but your needs, your spiritual needs, your spiritual growth. 
and and the and the the strength it takes to live on mission during the week. Let me just say this: a believer who does not pray does not have power. A church that does not pray does not have power. A preacher who does not pray does not have power. And maybe perhaps you're not seeing the power of God in your life because you're not dependent on God. You're not dependent on prayer. We need to be a church that depends and devotes ourselves to prayer and to God's word and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread. So that's what they devoted themselves to. But then kind of the second part of the text talks about the results of their devotion in verses 43 through 47. I'll read that again. Everyone was filled with awe and many wonders and signs were being performed through the apostles. Now all the believers were together and held all things in common. They sold their possessions and property and distributed the proceeds to any had as any had need. Every day they, there's that word again, they devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple and broke bread from house to house. They ate their food with joyful and sincere hearts and praising God and and enjoying the favor of all the people. And every day the Lord added to their number those that were being saved. So the first thing I see here as a result of their devotion is mutual care in verse 45. Mutual care, right? They were were selling their possessions and property and, and they were distributing the proceeds as any had need. And I don't want you to get too nervous because I'm not going to ask you to go home and sell everything you have and start giving it away. But a lot of people have taken this passage and twisted it and taught it in a way that that to to promote things like communism or socialism or, or ideas like that. And let me just say this. It is a difference between, especially in the book of Acts, you need to come to the text and you need to ask, is this a prescriptive text? a text that is prescribing the church to continue to do something, or is this a descriptive text? In other words, is it just describing the events that were happening during that time? And let me just say this. This is a descriptive text of how the church was operating during that time. Although, I will say this, that the Bible teaches radical generosity. Jesus asked a lot of people, like, hey, you need to sell your possessions and give to the poor because their possessions had them right? The possessions own their owners. And so if that is you and you feel like it's your possessions that are controlling your life, maybe you do need to sell some things and give some things away. Because we need to be known as people who are radically generous. But this text is a descriptive text, not a prescriptive. In other words, things like socialism might teach that that what's yours is ours, but Christianity teaches what is mine is yours. It is a voluntary action because of what God has done in your life. Because God has saved you and has been radically generous to you, you therefore are radically generous to other people. And I hope that makes sense. It's a voluntary thing that that comes from the overflow of your heart. But the, the early church apostles, the early church believers, it seems that they have adopted this idea that a need plus awareness equals responsibility. In other words, they, if there is a need in the community and, and the church knew about it, they took responsibility for it. And I believe that we need to see more churches stepping up and serving our communities like this today. But they were, we saw this mutual care happening, happening because of their devotion to the right things. The second thing we see here is unity. Unity. Um, In Acts chapter 4, it describes the unity this way. Now the entire group of those who believed were of one heart and mind. And no one claimed that any of his possessions was his own, but instead they held, here, here, here it is, they held all things in common. That's incredible. With great power, the apostles were giving testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was on all of them. For there was not a needy person among them because all of those who owned lands and houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid them at the apostles' feet. And this then was distributed to each person as any had need. And so this is important for the church to model after that, yes, we are called to radical generosity and to take care of the needs around us, but they were unified, right? Right. Those who believed had one heart, 
in one mind and they held all things in common. But here's the thing. Unity does not mean uniformity. Unity does not mean uniformity. In other words, the church should be diverse, right? The church should be diverse. Everybody is welcome in. God's heart throughout Scripture is for every nation, every language, and every skin color. Unity does not mean uniformity. Our unity, though, is found in the gospel of Christ. That's what unifies us. In other words, every one of us, the only difference between us, the believer, and those that are non-believers is that I am a sinner saved by grace. We all started in the same boat. So I don't know why we look down on those outside the church walls, because guess what? If you were not saved and changed by the gospel, you would be doing exactly what they're doing right now. We are all sinners saved by grace. So our unity is found in the gospel and the fact that Jesus saved our life. And our job is to bring love and unity, not division or strife. So we need to show the outside world that we are unified and that we're taking care of each other and taking care of the needs in the community, and we devote ourselves to the right thing. Not only that, number three, under the results of the early church's devotion, is missional living. We see a church that's on mission. In verse 43, everyone was filled with awe, and many signs and wonders were being performed through the apostles. Verse 46, every day they devoted themselves to Meeting together in the temple, they broke bread from house to house. They ate their food with joyful and sincere hearts, praising God, enjoying the favor of all the people. Every day the Lord added to their numbers those that were being saved. The early church, they, they would meet together in these large groups at the temple, and, and they would hear the apostles' teaching. They would devote themselves to that teaching. And then we see a church that's living out their faith, right? In the book of Acts, it's, it's all about Man, the Holy Spirit is is doing a work through the church, and we see growth, and we see serving, and we see loving, and we see sharing, and and, and sharing of the gospel, and planting of new churches, and all this kind of stuff that was happening. So we see the the devotion from their large group um, gatherings, such as a Sunday morning service that translated into them preparing them for a week of ministry out there. But oftentimes, we, we like to put the ministry on the ministers. We like to say, you know what, it's the job of the ministers to do the ministry, but the the scripture in Ephesians tells us that our job as ministers is to equip the saints for the work of ministry. So you come here and, 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 and your devotion to our time together in the word of God and in worship prepares you for the proclamation of the gospel for the rest of the week. So you are here to be equipped so that you can be sent out to live on mission for Christ. And then notice in verse 47, possibly the most encouraging uh, verse in this passage. It is the, the Lord God who grew the church. In other words, as a church, I would encourage you to devote yourself to the right things and trust God with the results. I'm not saying that you don't have a part to do or you, you don't have a responsibility to do um, But but we do what we can do, and then we trust God with the results, and he is the one who added to the church those that were being saved. And so as, as, as you preach the gospel, as you go out and minister to others during the week, you do that connected to, to Jesus and connected to the Holy Spirit, but only God can change their heart. God is just working in you to work through you, and, and you will begin seeing fruit if you rely and attach yourself to him. Like John 15 says, that he is the true vine, right? Apart from him, you can do nothing. That's how I feel as the ABS director. Apart from Christ, I can do nothing. And I want you to get that apart from him, you can do nothing. But guess what? You need this church, and you need this community, and you need to, to v- devote yourself to the right thing. And then I believe a result of that will be missional care, or mutual care and missional living and unity will come out of that. And that's exactly what this outside world needs you to do. Keep doing what you're doing so that we at the ABS can continue to do what we do as well. I want to say this here at the end um, because this has a lot to do with the church. It has a lot to do with believers. Let me just say this. If you are an unbeliever, you're not a part of the family. 
And I, I say that in the most loving way possible because I think there's a lie that's out there that you've probably heard someone say, well, we're all just children of God, right? We're all children of God. Let me say this, that's bad theology. That's false theology. We're not all children of God. You are all made in the image of God, but to be a child of God, you must be adopted back into the family of God because it is your sin that separates you outside of the family, right? So if you're not saved, if you haven't, if you haven't placed your faith and your trust in Jesus and you're not saved, then you're not part of the family, but you can be. And that invitation is open to you today. If you want to be a part of the family of God, I'm not saying you can't belong here. I'm saying that you won't be a part of the family of God without placing your faith and trust in Jesus. The only way, the only way that you can be saved and brought back and adopted into the family of God. So if that's where you are today and that's the decision you need to make, I pray that you'll make it today. I pray that you'll make it today. Just like uh, he prayed earlier before it's too late. Make that decision this morning and, and become a, a child of God, become a part of the family, and be a part of what God is doing here at Brister Baptist Church. I appreciate you so much for letting me do this. I want to pray, and we'll enter into a time of invitation, um, and we'll, we'll move on. Let me pray for you. Father, I thank you so much for your word. I thank you for this church that supports us and encourages us to do and continue to do what we do. We know that there is a there is a world outside of this church that is hurting, that is struggling to find purpose, or maybe they're struggling with anxiety or loneliness or depression or whatever the case may be. I pray that we would be unified as a church and we would devote ourselves to the right things, and I pray that I've that we might be encouraged and built up together through the reading and teaching of your word. And I pray that the Holy Spirit would stir in this morning. That these are not my words. This is, that today is not about me. It's not about Brister Baptist Church. It's not about any name that's on a sign outside. It's all about you, that we might make much of Jesus and less of us. Lord, we love you so much. That's why we gather together. That's why we worship but I pray that today the church was built up. I pray that the church was equipped to go and do ministry this week and to love others well because of the love we've received from Christ and the salvation we've received from Christ that we can now go and love others and serve others well. We love you so much. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.